During slavery, families were constantly ripped apart. The, the mattresses are made of moss. We're going to throw some sausage maybe, some chicken in that pot. Um, but she was purchased from another plantation to come and work here. She was only allowed to bring two of her children. And so you lost a lot of enslaved people. You know, they literally worked around the clock during this time. Hi, my name is Janiel. Welcome to Culture Trekking, where I try to collect unique stories from around the globe that focus on sustainable adventure and cultural connections. I call Utah home, but today I am taking you to Destrehan Plantation in good old Louisiana. So we're out here at the Destrehan Plantation. This is one of the stops along the 1811 Slave Revolt Trail. I'll put the QR code right up here that you can scan when you're out here. And it's a little bit of audio that will take you through the history of this place along the trail and the stops, what it was like during that time. Now, I think this is gonna be a very moving and real raw tour. I'm very excited to learn the real history of these places. All right, we are here with one of the best tour guides at Destrehan, Diane. Hi, so I'm very happy to be here today. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about what the tour is about. I, you know, I introduced them to the 1811 Flavor Bolt Trail, mm -hmm. and this is one of the stops. So can you kind of walk us through some of the main points of what we're gonna see on the tour today? Uh, well, my tour addresses uh, the marginalized groups here in Louisiana that first settled, um, especially the enslaved people. So we talk a lot about them, and then we do um, one or two demonstrations along the way, you know, our music and food ways. We talk a lot about the creolization process um, of Louisiana as well. So you have this outfit on. Is this, uh, now you probably don't wear this every day, mm. or do you? Um, I, I actually wear them quite a bit. Isn't it hot though? I'm, you know, I'm from Utah. <laughs> desert country and I'm just standing in this air-conditioned area and I'm like sticky sweating so oh my how do you do it so what is it does it have any significance for you or yes uh, in 1785 then Louisiana governor Miro required all free women of color to cover their hair because mm. he wanted them to look more like enslaved women there was this growing population of free people of color and the free women of color had a lot to do with that so he thought he would oppress them, um, but they didn't just wear little head rags like you may see an enslaved person wearing in the field or doing a tour. Um, they had more access to fabrics, they had more money, so they would take all of this fabric, you know, and wrap it up. And I always say they turned rags of oppression into crowns of distinction. Oh, that so, is so beautiful. Yes. Um, and the, you know, they did different colors and. Uh, some of them would put brooches and feathers in their their crowns, so to speak, but they're called the Tignon, and it's known as the infamous Tignon Law. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to go on this tour with you and, and taking just a second to explain a little bit more about the nuances of this plantation. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I was so excited for this tour. I nearly lost my words on that interview but get ready to be taught and inspired. For unheard voices to give voice to all the marginalized people you don't typically hear about on plantation tours. Um, and we're gonna get into them in a little bit. But first, our first stop is um, the slave cabin. Now, uh, these would not have been this close to the main house. They would have been about a fourth of a mile up the road. Destrehan had up to 24 slave cabins at one point. They were built in rows and they were facing each other. Beside each cabin, you would have found a small vegetable garden. This is because we operated under something called the Creole system of slavery. It wasn't any easier or better, it was just different. The enslaved people may have worked a few hours a shorter day than other enslaved people, but they were provided less food sources um, and clothing. So they had to provide those things for themselves, hence the vegetable garden. Um, the other thing is, if you notice, these are built like Creole cottages. You've probably seen a lot of those in the French Quarter maybe. Um, they were not always raised. 
um, you would have had four to eight people living in either side, not necessarily families, because remember during slavery, families were constantly ripped apart, children were bought and sold, and so forth. We have posted here are the actual inventory records of the enslaved people that would have been here at Destrehan Plantation. And these are a plethora of information. You know, while we hate the reasons they were there, at least they give us a lot of information as to who the enslaved people were. You can see by the time sugarcane became popular in, in Louisiana and especially here at Destrehan Plantation, you can see how the list basically grew. Um, and you can see they're very crudely built. They had to be built quickly, right? The other thing is there would have been a shared fireplace in either side. They didn't always cook inside though. You know, you gotta think if you're gonna start a fire right now, it's hot, you know, so they would probably be outside cooking and um, doing things like that. The bed, I think, was a luxury, you know, for some people. Um, their owners may have given them a bed or they may have found scraps of wood to make a bed. The, the mattresses are made of moss just like the mattresses in the, the main house. Like Spanish moss? Yes. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. So this, this would have been um, a child's pallet, but you know, if you have like three adults and one child, Orleans in 1718, because the French wanted to control the commerce that was coming and going up and down the Mississippi, away from the British. So, but before that, you had thousands of Native Americans in the area who basically kind of just took the land and said, okay, we're claiming this for France. So you had Native Americans, you had French. In the 1720s, um, the French basically got the Germans to come over. They lied to them and told them these were lands of silver and gold and all this stuff. So. The poor Germans came over and of course there was no silver, no gold, no beautiful forest, none of that. Um, in fact, there was the East Choctaw who were in cahoots with the British um, trying to get rid of anybody who came to colonize with the French. At any rate, the French crown basically gave them some land upriver uh, in this area. Today it's known as the German coast. They were very hardy people, they would grow crops. They would load everything onto flotillas once they were grown, take them down to New Orleans, settle on the levee for a day or two, and sell everything to the colonists. And then they would come back up to the German coast and start all over again. Part of the African's diet. So uh, it was brought over with them. Um, so then you have the French root, the R-O-U-X, which is basically the flour cooked in the fat, which is also, before the French, it was Italian in origin. But we're not going there yet. <laughs> so we have the roux, and then we're going to put in there what? Our Holy Trinity. And the Holy Trinity, we want to thank the Germans from the German coast. We always credit them with that, uh, simply because they, they were the farmers and they kept Louisiana fed. So our Holy Trinity is going to be onion, celery, and bell pepper which is a descendant, we believe, of the French Mirepoix. Um, and then who are you going to put in the pot next? How about we throw some Germans and Acadians in that pot, right? We're going to throw some sausage maybe, some chicken in that pot. So the Acadians didn't arrive until between the 1760s and 1780s, which is when you had your first uh, large influx of Acadians who came down from Nova Scotia. They were basically ousted by the British for religious persecution. Um, and of course, they found uh, a home here in Catholic Louisiana. The French crown required us to practice Catholicism. So the Acadians were very comfortable uh, with that. They settled alongside the Germans. So you had the development of sausages like the andouille, which is mostly pork shoulder and fat. Um, you had different types of smoked sausage. Eventually, you had the boudin and so forth. So we put all of that in our pot. Who else could we put in the pot? We could, we could slow cook it for, for a nice long time and let all of those flavors break down and marry. So we can thank the enslaved Africans for that. We have the Native Americans in the pot with the bay leaf, uh, which is what they introduced us to, as well as the filet, which is basically dried and crushed up sassafras. 
Uh, later on, you had the Spanish, of course, who came in, who brought us the tomato itself. But it wasn't until the Sicilians that we had the tomato gravy and things of that nature. Like, um, they also brought us the muffalata and the mob. But that's a whole <laughs> other story. That's a whole other story. It was then on into the home to learn about house slaves. Um, she was born in Louisiana in 1740, which makes her a, that makes her Creole. Marguerite had five children, um, but she was purchased from another plantation to come and work here. She was only allowed to bring two of her children um, because your children could not be separated from you until they reached the age of puberty. After that, it did not matter. So her other children were left at the other plantation she never saw them um, again. It wasn't until one of her grandchildren that anyone in her family saw freedom uh, after the Civil War. So Marguerite and her children passed away here, enslaved at Destrehan. She is listed as a cook and a laundress. She's also listed as having a hernia. And we're pretty sure it was from lifting heavy pots and doing all this laundry. Also, the children of the house, not her children, would eat in this room with her until they were ready and their manners were okay to sit at the big table, you know, or eat among adults. Um, so again, if you can imagine, you know, she's passing on her history and language and music to these children while they try to erase all of that. You know, she was born here in Louisiana. Her, pa her parents were of African descent. So some of that is inadvertently going to get passed on. You know, you can imagine the stories she's probably telling them and the music. You know, she may be singing them um, some sort of lullaby or something. Um, but these enslaved women, you know, they were very instrumental in the lives of the children back then, um, even down to suckling the children, you know. I do want to introduce you to Charles Paquet. So Charles Paquet, was born an enslaved man. His birth year was unknown. Um, and his father uh, passed away. Um, there was land sold, and Charles eventually was able to buy his freedom. Now, before he was free, though, he went to contract with Robin de Longay to build Destrehan Plantation. It lists him as a free person of color. He was still enslaved when he went into contract. He did eventually get paid for doing the work with six other enslaved people. Um, but you can see it took three years, and we're gonna go through the house. You can see this amazing work, uh, the work of basically, you know, Charles at the lead with six enslaved people. The walls, the bricks were all handmade. All of these arches, um, it's mostly made of cypress. Some things we've replaced, like, of course, the flooring, which would have crumbled. These old bricks, um, you know, they crumble over time, which is why you see all the ones in the French Quarter covered in plaster, because they're not made of, you know, the same stuff as, as we see bricks today. In any number of ways, you could earn some money. I say some money because uh, your owner had the right to keep a portion of it, if not all of it just depending on who the person was. The Spanish came in in 1762 and they brought with them a law called Cortacion, and that was where an enslaved person could buy their freedom. Um, you basically had to petition the court. Your owner had to say yes or no, they were okay with it or not. <clears throat> and then you had to have an appraiser come in and tell you how much you were worth, and you had to agree or not, depending on if you had that sum of money. Um, and some people think it's just wonderful that people could buy their freedom. We have to keep in mind it was only about 2% of all enslaved people here in Louisiana that could ever, uh, you know, get to the point where they would buy their freedom. And it was a long process. So. I realized as I was walking through the house that these house slaves, they knew how to cook clean. They were over food, delicious food, but yet... They weren't able to eat it or even try it other than preparing it for their master. 
Can you imagine being a six-year-old kid that is standing over gelatin like this and not being able to eat it, knowing that if you even tasted a little bit, you'd be taken out and beaten? Going upstairs. As the tour went on, it was legitimately hard for me not to get a few tears in my eyes over the conditions the slaves had to live in and work in. Namely, people like Marguerite would have been made to sleep on the floor right outside the door uh, and everything that the person would need at night, she would have to tend to. Um, and then, of course, still be awake and, you know, serving coffee or doing whatever she had to do at, you know, three, four, five o'clock in the morning the next day. It was excruciating work. In some cases, you know, people think that working in the field was a lot easier than working in the house maybe, but that's just not the case. You know, you know how we kind of get cross when we don't get enough sleep and then we're tired, we get stressed out. In one week's time, you just like, you know, ready to pull your hair out. But, um, you know, these women constantly went through this. Uh, in some cases, they died very young uh, because of it. Um, and then you have to think about, you know, you're always under somebody's thumb. You know, that somebody's always listening to you or watching you. You know, you're always having to tend to somebody. You know, in the field, the work was hard. It was a different kind of hard, though. So I always try to, to, to bust that myth about working in the house was just such a, you know, such a wonderful thing to do. It was not. These women had very difficult lives. So the girl that died in here? Yes, Lydia. Lydia of Yellow Fever. Yes. Okay. Because Lydia died in this room from yellow fever, Diane said that this is, this is the one room in the house that they noticed the most paranormal activity. So all you ghost lovers out there, this one's for you. The next room we went into was the interpretive architecture room. Now, originally it was taken apart for an architecture exhibition and, and archaeology study, and then they discovered that there were fingerprints from slaves in the mud of the walls. They would start out with a wooden structure and put mud in the walls of the home, and then they would put more slat, wooden slats on top of that, and Spanish moss mixed in there to help absorb the moisture of Louisiana, and then more mud on top of that, and then a limestone plaster that was actually helpful in keeping away infections. A Spanish moss, uh, it would be very pliable. You would have slats that would be um, put up, and then over each slat, you would take that little loaf of bread looking piece of bousillage and you move it out and then put the holes in it and then start with the next layer. There's something so incredible about standing in a room that slaves had put in together. I don't know what it is about their stories, but it's just so inspiring to me. Their resilience during this period to survive, it kind of makes me feel like I need to tackle my own problems a little bit better than I do sometimes. this room and this is where the Freedmen's Bureau um, first had their office here at Destrehan Plantation. So y'all know during the Civil War um, we were one of the first places to be captured. The Destrehan family of course ran off and left. Uh, so the federal government seized the property. They started something called the Freedmen's Bureau which is where formerly enslaved people and impoverished white people and others could come and get education, you could get medical care. You had people that would go out with you from the government and they would represent you to get uh, work contracts, say if you were working on another plantation, because uh, remember slavery's done at this point. Um, and you needed someone to represent you to get a fair contract. They would go out and represent you and help you get that. There was uh, uh, two hospitals here on Destrehan's grounds. At one point, there were over a thousand people that were treated. You had roughly maybe 700 people a day um, that were here, that were coming and going. You had people sleeping in the house. You had people sleeping outside in the slave cabins uh, who were no longer enslaved. 
So eventually the Freedmen's Bureau became known as the Ross Home Colony because the home was owned uh, by Judge Ross at the time who had married into the Destrehan family. He came back and he reclaimed his property, but the Freedmen's Bureau or Ross Home Colony uh, was allowed to stay for about another year um, after the family had come back after the Civil War. So this is Jean Noel Destrehan. He was uh, one of the sons of Jean Baptiste Destrehan, the French royal treasurer. And um, we talked a little bit about how he purchased the plantation from Robert de Launay. He was a statesman. Um, he was one of the four, uh, four people chosen by Thomas Jefferson to help write the first Louisiana Constitution. He also owned up to almost 200 enslaved people. Um, and he also rescinded the law of coartacion, where an enslaved person could buy their freedom. Well, in 1807, he was one of the people that said no more. Thanks. Uh, yes. Um, so, in 1811, January of 1811, it was the largest slave revolt um, in the country. Uh, between 125 and 500 people took part in this revolt. We do not know the exact number. Uh, it started around in uh, present-day present Laplace, and it lasted about two days until uh, the group was confronted by the militia. They scattered into different directions. Um, in the long run, though, over 100 people, enslaved people, were killed as a result of the revolt, and only two white people died as a result. Uh, they did burn um, a couple houses. They burned down um, some sugar mills. So we can kind of see what their mindset was. You know, sugar harvesting was brutal. Um, at any rate, there were 29 enslaved people that were held captive here at Destrehan Plantation once the revolt was over. Uh, there were three trials that were held. One was in Laplace, one was here at Destrehan with those 29 people, and then one was down in New Orleans. Out of the 29, 26 of them were shot to death, beheaded, and their heads were placed on posts outside of their owners' plantations. So it said that if you were rode from New Orleans all the way to Laplace, which is a good 25 miles out of New Orleans, you could see heads on posts along the way. Um, the other enslaved people, of course, that were killed were uh, killed during the revolt. And then some were put to death after the trial in Laplace as well as down in New Orleans. The trial that was held here, we believe it was somewhere either in the front of the house or in front of the house here at Destrehan because it was uh, public. So one of the reasons they chose Jean Noel was because it was said that he was fair. And um, he sat on the jury with a judge and then there were uh, five other men that sat with him. You know, I've heard accounts, you know, where he was fair and he would get out in the field when they were working the sugar cane and uh, not so much help uh, as do certain chores maybe. Um, you know, the mindset um, of people back then, you, just, you can't get into people's heads. Right. Um, as much as you look at the things they did, like he did rescind the law of Cortacion. Um, he did agree to have 26 people put to death. He did, uh, you know, pr produce sugar every year, which killed thousands and thousands of people. Um, I've had another descendant of, of his, you know, send me these long letters about how, you know, he really was fair for the time back then and try to prove it and all of this stuff. Um, I, I don't think, I don't see where he was so fair, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm living in 2020. Um, right, okay, that makes sense. I, I think it was brutal, I think he was brutal, you know. He also, uh, he was very much a Creole, you know, in, in the things that he did and the way he handled his business. 
Um, he was very French. He didn't like living in the French Quarter, which he did off and on for about 20 years. Couldn't stand Americans. You know, didn't want to speak English. So there's a lot of little things to his character as to whether he was fair, because you know, black people own enslaved people too. Right. So as to whether he was fair in some way, somehow, I have not seen it on paper, and I don't know. Um, it's heartbreaking. Sometimes it's gut-wrenching, yeah. you know, because I don't know. Um, I do know, you know, about the domestic slave trade and what men did, you know, to keep that going. Yeah. Um, the rape and, and just all of the things that have the atrocities that happened are so unreal that I, you know. It's hard to say. It's very difficult to say, but I, you can see I try to be somewhat diplomatic because mm -hmm. you don't, you just don't know. Right. But looking at it overall, no, he wasn't fair. Right. This is so crazy. Some of the stories here. I read that like after learning about the house slaves, it was out to learn about the field slaves and their lives. The stories that she's telling here are just so crazy. And I feel like this is, this tour, this plantation, it really highlights what it was like to be a slave here, to work here, both in the house and in the fields. This next part is one of my favorite parts of the entire tour, but as we walked out to the kitchen area, the outdoor kitchen area, it was hard to believe that a place that seemed so beautiful could hold such atrocities. And to be able to have this time to unwind from what we had heard in the big house to what we would experience of the slaves and their music and their lives that were in the field. Um, I don't know, I just can't encourage you guys enough to take this tour with Diane. Our next stop was the Rost Home Colony exhibit. This exhibit is dedicated to the thousands of freed men, women, and children and other refugees from the Civil War who received housing rations, medical care, education, employment at the Rost Home Colony at the Destrehan Plantation between 1865 and 1866. After the Ross Home Colony Memorial Center, we headed over to the washroom where the slaves that were held for trial were crammed into this small room. The lighter pieces of wood indicate those slaves who lost their lives. It's a very sobering, very intimate, very sad scene, but I think it's important that we realize and face and recognize our history. This, as Diane mentioned, is her favorite part of the tour, and I dare say it is also my favorite part of this tour. She introduced the music of freed men of color as well as a real Mardi Gras Indian. Um, usually I have a little picture of Edmund Day Day here, but he's not here right now. So he was uh, another free man of color. He was um, educated in Europe. He actually became a famous composer for his time. People associate New Orleans with jazz mostly, uh, but we were not just known for that. Symphony was played in New Orleans. There was the Opera House that was founded in New Orleans that was actually attended by enslaved people as well. So I'm gonna let you hear a little bit of Edmund Day Day. This was him. Isn't that beautiful? Well, well we sing Indian Raid. Indian Raid is something that we do at the beginning and at the end of whatever it is we're doing. Uh, normally when we practice, uh, we sing Indian Raid. Every year, um, every Sunday, we go to a, a, a local bar where we have different tribes come from different parts of the city. And we basically are rehearsing what we're going to do on Carnival Day, or Mardi Gras Day. So um, when, the, when the practice starts, we, call, we sing Indian Raid. It allows each member, there are several members in the tribe, and those members, those positions are the spy boy, he would be the eyes of the tribe, he's the scout. He's three blocks in front of everybody, he's scouting looking for other fellas. Um, we are basically playing a war game. Back in the days, they used to physically fight. My daddy is known for being responsible for stopping the violence within it. And it's now about who can be the prettiest, so that's where we're at now. But when we sing in your red, 
it allows each member to come out and do his thing before we go out for battle. We are lining up to go to battle. I call you respond. It goes like this. The first person he would call out would be the spy boy, then the flag boy. His responsibility is to carry the name on the flag of that particular tribe, because there's several tribes on the street. We're on the street playing a war game. Back in the days, they physically fought. My daddy is known for being responsible for stopping the violence within the tradition. Now it's known for being the prettiest. So that's, what so that's why I say I'm pretty, and, I'm, and normally I'll have on a suit. So. Yes. You know, um, it's, it's quite uh, dramatic and interesting and very spiritual, actually. So, um, we're good. all right, we're good. Y'all enjoy that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Music was a way for the slaves of the field to heal, to pass messages from one slave to another or even one plantation to another. The work was grueling. You didn't have a day off and you worked until you were either disabled or dead. Women, if they got pregnant, they were required to continue working until they either gave labor in a house, in one of their shacks, or oftentimes in the field itself. Violence was the way to keep people in line and often the overseers were assisted by the male house slaves. Three months to, to cut it and process it and be done with it. Um, and so you lost a lot of enslaved people. You know, they literally worked around the clock during this time. Um, uh, it was brutal. You know, you might spend time chopping cane in the morning and then by the evening, you're basically ladling the, the uh, boiled sugar from one kettle to another. So the system went where there would be four kettles in a row you know, and then um, the system went from the largest kettle on down to the last. Uh, this is where Nobel's uh, uh, invention came into play. 
you know, it made it easier and less dangerous. It was still difficult, but it was somewhat easier and less dangerous, um, but for which he, he basically got no credit here, you know, and we believe they may have used that method uh, here at Destrahan at one point as well. It was very sobering to think that the only thing that would mourn these lives or come close to it was when it would rain, as if this heaven itself was mourning how humans were treating each other during this time. If you get a chance to visit Destrehan, I highly suggest going on the tour with Diane to listen to the unheard voices of the German coast, where she goes over the currency used to buy slaves and who would sell them and where they would come and how they would live and survive. They also have a great museum to go through as well, with many artifacts found at the plantation. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share it with a friend that you think would enjoy this or learn from it. See you in the next one. Bye.